Wi-Fi Sheep would like to say a huge thank you to all of you that kindly support us. Help us continue to bring new videos like this. Join patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep from just $1 a month. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Uh, welcome back to Wi-Fi Sheep here on YouTube with me, Tom, and part four of our Tiny Basic Computers build series right here on the channel. If you're not up to speed, let me give you a quick overview and introduction. Last year, I started a project to see if it was actually possible to build real 8-bit working and programmable computers out of a bare minimal of parts and without needing specialist computer science or engineering knowledge. The result was tiny basic computers. The computer that we ended up building, and we used a solderless breadboard to do this, was the equivalent of a sort of Altair type machine that you would have seen in the mid to late 1970s. I won't go for the full introduction here today, but you can see that on our playlist. And if you're not up to speed on the project so far, do check out our playlist and watch through until you can join us here on part four. Before we go any further, let me remind you of the turnkey PCB assembly services provided by our partners at PCBGoGo.com. These include PCB manufacturing and assembly, component sourcing, functional testing, and IC programming. PCB GoGo manufacturing bases are equipped with the most advanced production equipment, such as Yamaha pick and place machines, reflow oven, wave soldering machines, X ray, and AOI testing machines, all operated by highly skilled technical personnel. PCB GoGo is a leading specialist in surface mount, through hole, and mixed technology PCB assembly and electronic manufacturing services, as well as turnkey electronic PCB assembly. PCB GoGo provides easy and cost effective online ordering services from prototype to mass production. So join now. Sign up for your free account today at PCBGoGo.com. So in today's video, we are returning to our primary build of our tiny basic computer. This is the hardware that we left off on the second episode. However, those of you that have been following the series may remember that I actually showed briefly an upgrade to the unit and some improvements I've been made, basically quality of life improvements to the design. Well, today we're going to go through those quality of life improvements and you can decide which ones, if any, you actually want to implement in your own builds. I stress everything today is completely optional. You don't have to do any of it, but I believe it is well worth a look. So we'll start with the main basic interpreter and kernel ROM update. If you remember, we flash hex ROMs straight to our Arduino Nano chips, and I've been working on a couple of improvements to the main kernel. So take a look at this. If you're going to update or reflash the ROM, and we showed you how to do that using the XLoader software on Windows, then you need to disconnect the serial lead, which is why we left this lead here as a jumper wire and not a more permanently cut piece of wire. So we can actually disconnect one side from the terminal. This won't flash properly if it's connected still via serial terminal to the other board. So now it's disconnected, we can plug back in, plug the other side into our PC and we can download and using XLoader on Windows, we can reflash the new ROM kernel, which will include the new basic interpreter onto the main CPU drive. And of course, once we've done that, we can reconnect to the RX pin on our second Arduino. And we can power up. Now the improvements to the ROM, I've done a few little sort of tidy ops behind the scenes, effectively, those of you that built the original machine will have noticed that when you boot it cold for the first time, you usually get some garbage on the screen. It'll load up, it'll say something like Wi-Fi Sheep, tiny basic computer, uh, the Wi-Fi Sheep.co.uk. Then it will print a load of garbage, sometimes random anything, sometimes some characters, letters. It should say hello. And what's happening is that because these are two standalone devices, they're booting at the same time, this boots instantly and then it sends data straight to the terminal. But of course the terminal may be a couple of milliseconds behind, so it's not quite ready to receive data. And so when the data comes in, it just comes in as scrambled rubbish until it's fully up to speed and then it starts interpreting correctly. 
So the way around that is to add a 300 millisecond delay to the boot this side, and it just gives enough time for the terminal to be up and running, meaning you get a clean transfer every time you switch the machine on. So there's two ways to download the new ROM. You can either download it by joining our Facebook group, that's www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash WFS Tiny Basic. Or for those of you that support us on Patreon, that's patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep, you can download the Tiny Basic Computers Toolkit, which contains the ROMs and also some additional software. And you can find that on our £2, that's $3, general support and downloads tier. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep. This download will be the last one made available for free to members of our Facebook group. We are intending to do some major update work to both the video terminal side and the basic kernel going forwards. Those will only be available to future to our Patreon backers, so you will need to join our free dollar tier on Patreon. Okay, so the second update is to do with the only capacitor we're currently using on the system, and it's this 104 ceramic disc capacitor. And for those of you that remember, we are using this as a smoothing capacitor to try and help eliminate electrical noise, which can also interfere with the character set and you get funny characters appearing on screen. It's not 100% perfect, but it is an improvement. So I started by using this little capacitor here, which is, as I said, a 104 and it's not polarity uh, sensitive, so it doesn't really matter. There's no positive or negative leg, it's just a one and two leg. And we were bridging it just where the power comes off the main volts rail to go into the second nano. We were bridging it just there between negative and positive. So it doesn't create a short, remember it's a capacitor. So what happens is that this capacitor charges up. It's like a little battery. And if there's an in, uh, interference or uh, intermittent power supply and the power voltage drops, this capacitor will then basically leak its power back out and fill up the gap that's missed. So it helps to smooth any troughs or bumps in the power supply and then helps to uh, limit interference and noise. However, I have found that the 104 is a little bit weak at doing this job. So I've actually decided to switch it out. So instead of using a ceramic disc capacitor, I actually decided to switch out and use an electrolytic capacitor. These are a little bit more heavy duty and you buy them on little packs like this. Again, they're very, very cheap. So let's just take one off and show you. So does the same job, but these are the uh, capacitors or caps that look a little bit more like little batteries or mini batteries. Uh, I used to think of them as that. So this is a 10 picofarad electrolytic capacitor. And it has a little bit more oomph to it than the 104. Bear in mind, the 104 is not 104 picofarads. It's, I forget exactly, it might be the same value, but it's just a little bit weak. So when you hear uh, on various retro channels and people talking about bad caps, leaky caps, blown caps, dried caps, or caps reforming, what they're actually referring to are capacitors a little bit like this. So this has a fluid called an electrolytic inside it, and it's that that can go wrong, bulge, break, leak, etc., etc. It's also worth noting that these capacitors, I don't know if I can just show you that on camera, here we go, have a stripe down one side, and they are actually polarized. So again, like with the LED, there's a long leg and a short leg. Long leg is positive, short leg is negative. The stripe also indicates negative. It is really important if you're going to use these that you do get these in the correct way around. The wrong way around, they do have a tendency to pop and explode. So we're just going to add this to our circuit in place of where we had the ceramic disc capacitor previously. So making sure we get this the right way around. So in our case, the red rail is positive. So there's the long leg. What you might find you have to do if it doesn't fit properly is just trim the legs down. Obviously, if the leg's now trimmed in the same size, you need to look at which leg has the stripe on, and then you get it in the quite way around. There we go. And that will help to minimise the amount of electrical interference on the board. Okay, so next mini upgrade we can look at is actually the keyboard interface itself. So let's just bring this 
into camera so you can see it. So we've been using a USB to PS2 adapter and here is the actual IBM standard PS2 connector and we've been linking it via four pins on the back. Now it came to my attention that a lot of us are actually using USB keyboards. As I said at the intro, if you have a keyboard that's capable of running PS2 protocols, unfortunately it's not that clear, but most PC USB keyboards still have a PS2 protocol, and so these sort of adapters work. But if we're using USB, then why do we need the PS2 socket? Well, we don't actually. Believe it or not, we could actually go straight into USB uh, and it would just pick up the protocol. So what I have here is almost an identical type little mini PCB with a header. Now I've slightly broken the no solder rule with this. I did have to solder on the jumpers on the back, but you can buy these pre-built mostly. So I think it's okay. I have seen them online, usually with a blue PCB, not a green. And you have four pins just like you do with the PS2. So the way this works is if we disconnect, uh, let's just take the voltage off first. So. The pins are in slightly different order. So VBUS is voltage, which is our red cable. And ground is obviously neutral, which is black. And then you'll notice here on the PS2 connector, if it's upside down, you've got clock and dat. And those correspond here to D minus and D plus on the USB. So D minus is the equivalent of dat and D plus is the equivalent of clock. And make sure we got this the correct way around. And that will work as long as you're still using a PS2 protocol via the USB. So you can use this and then it means you don't need the adapter anymore because you're going straight into the device and these cables remain the same and are wired the correct way around on the main Arduino. Next is a very simple modification that allows for an alternative method for generating sound. Now it's come to my attention that many of you that are using the composite out don't have monitors capable of also taking the sound channel, so you're running in a, a muted state effectively. Of course, the sound protocols loaded do use up a little bit of memory, so it'd be nice if we could actually use them. One solution to this, and a lot of the 8-bit computers of the era did this, is they actually had a speaker on board and generated their sounds completely externally of any uh, TV. We can do the same here. So in order to do this, we're going to incorporate a buzzer. And I have a new buzzer here. So this buzzer is a 12 millimeter buzzer with eight millimeter uh, pin separation, or the space between the pins is eight mil. Uh, you can buy these in a number of voltage configurations. I bought the five volts buzzers, um, but I actually realized that the most of the logic on our boards are actually running in 3.3 volts. So the three volt buzzer would be better. The five volt will work, but we don't quite get the tonal range. So here it is, it's a quite a simple little device and it has two pins and it is uh, polarized. So it has on the top here, there's a little plus engraved and that's the uh, positive. So we will actually need to mount this effectively upside down. If we look at our circuit, you can see that the, the line comes off here, which is pin D5 off the main CPU nano, comes down here and then comes to a 1K resistor before going out to a jumper, which we were connecting via crocodile clip to an RCA jack. Now, if we don't want to connect up to a monitor anymore, we can actually take that jumper out and we can also need to take this 1K resistor out of circuit as well. All we then need to do is making sure we go plus is facing down is we can bridge between the gap in our uh, breadboard. So remember that these pins here and these pins here are not connected and we don't want to short between the two. So we're just going to come in line with where we connect the sound. So here and we're going to go up and bridge across. Of course, we're now going to need to bridge between here and here, and you can do that with a little bit of black wire, or if you've got yourself a jumper again, we can jump back off the negative and onto the ground like so, and that will then give us inbuilt sound, although admittedly, and you can hear the quality here, the quality is not as good and you don't quite have the tonal range.
And finally, I want to show you what I think is going to be considered quite a major upgrade. And again, this isn't at all necessary, but you might find it useful. And it's kind of interesting for us to learn about this anyway. So I was looking at the design, especially the side that we use for the video terminal. And to be honest with you, it seems a little bit wasteful to be using a whole nano just for generating video. The Nano, as with any Arduino board, have a lot of other features on board. So there's an EEPROM, there's a voltage regulator for outputting 5 volts and 3.3 volts, and there's a lot of RAM, etc. And most of this, including the GPIO pins, we're not actually using. So it seems slightly wasteful to tie a whole board up to generate just a video signal, which is effectively what we're using uh, this Nano for on our project. So I then started looking into the concept of could we actually replace this board with a single IC chip and here it is and the answer is yes we can you see this chip here is the Atmega 328P or PU to be exact and it is effectively the independent standalone microcontroller microprocessor that powers the Arduino system it's the same chip that you see here and also here but here it's on a different form factor so it's a surface mount square chip here, whereas this one is a more manageable, uh, what we call a, a package chip or dip package chip. And this is a, I think, 28 pin package chip. So it's quite a small chip, but it basically does the bulk of the functions we need without needing the entire Arduino. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take our Arduino board out. And for this, I might need to grab a flathead screwdriver just to very carefully. If you haven't got a chip puller, what you can do is just put a flathead screwdriver into the groove under the board and just gently pull upwards evenly on both sides. And we can remove our nano board. And in a moment, we will put our chip on. But first, we actually have to flash the terminal hex ROM to this chip. So in order to flash this chip, we're going to need to use a different type of Arduino board called the Arduino Uno. And I have one here. Now, the Unos are pretty much identical in uh, architecture to the Nano. It's just a larger board with a different setup uh, and more GPIO pin access. However, one thing to watch out for is you do need to make sure you have a proper Arduino for this, not a clone. This is a clone board and the giveaway is obviously the lack of the Arduino logo and also the, again, the package is that square surface mount chip, which is no good for what we need. What we actually need is a proper Arduino, and I have one here. So you can see this one has the full Arduino Uno brand, and you'll notice that the chip is one of these 26 pin or 24 pin dip socket chips. And it's this chip that we can program just as we would a normal Arduino Nano, and then we can take the chip out. So using a uh, correct standard USB lead, we can plug in and plug that into our PC as we would with the chip installed. Bear in mind these, if you buy the proper ones, they do come with at least one chip on board as standard. So make sure that's socketed properly. And we can select from Xloader, the, select the uh, hex ROM again for the either the NTSC or PAL video terminal. Select it as a Nano. I know it's a Nuno, but trust me on this, flash it as if it was a Nano. And then you can just reflash the terminal and that will write the code to this chip. Once we've done that, we can take the board out. What's different this time is again, either using a chip remover or a flathead screwdriver. And being very careful, we can actually take the chip out the board. And when dealing with chips, try not to touch or pick up the legs. So there we are, there's the chip out. And that has now got our terminal code on it, so we can actually do away with the rest of the board. Bearing in mind, these boards do not work unless they actually have a chip, because we've effectively taken the RAM and the microprocessor out. So you do need to make sure you have a couple of spurs that you can put in if you do need to use this board again. So we'll take those out of the way. 
and we now have our terminal based at mega 328p ready to be used as our video encoding terminal. However, the chip needs a little bit of assistance to run. So in order for this chip to run, it needs a clock or a pulse signal. You can usually buy these in little kits off AliExpress, eBay, but usually when you buy the chips, they actually come with the additional components needed to make them run independently. And I have here in a little plastic bag the parts you normally get as well as the chip. Let's just tip those out. So you get a, a chip holder, which you can use. We're not going to use that in our design because we can plug straight into the breadboard, but you do get one of those little chip holders. You also get a quartz crystal. And this will be used to determine the speed and frequency that our chip runs at. And you can see, just make out on there, it actually reads 16 dot zero 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 which is 16 megahertz which is the correct speed we want to run the chip at and you'll also get two or three of these little ceramic capacitors we're back to using ceramic capacitors again these are 22s and we need two of those to make the circuit so let's return to our main breadboard and we're going to focus on this area where we took out our nano because we now need to change effectively all where the pin connections go because it's going to be different for the standalone chip. So let's just disconnect the serial. Let's take out the two video lines. We'll take out the voltage, put those just to one side. And we also need to take out this wire, which was acting as our reset to the second chip. So we need to take that out. Okay, so all we've got left is the buzzer. We've got the two resistors for the video circuit. We've still got our capacitor up here, but we now need to rewire this area to work with the chip. So first of all, let's put the main chip in. Now, the way of determining which way is which, with, especially with microprocessors and microchips in general, is they have a little mark or a notch here. And that means we need to turn this chip around Line the legs up again so the chip goes between the gap. We don't want to short across the legs. And we can make sure the pins are lined up. We'll push the new chip in. There we go. So I've put a diagram up just showing the way this works. So the first thing I think we'll do is we're going to get our uh, crystal and clock up and running. So crystals like this don't have a, a particular polarity. They can go either way. And we'll put this, let's see, we'll sort of go over here, I think. And then what we need to do is each side of this crystal needs to be sent to ground. So we'll take our tiny little 22 um, ceramic capacitors and we'll bridge from ground to one leg. And we'll bridge ground to the other leg and again this is really fiddly to do especially when you're behind a camera can't see straight so now what we're going to do is we're going to bridge the other side of the legs to two pins on the chip and these are pins 10 and 9 now there's no markings on most chips to tell you which these are so we need to count backwards so from 14 here we go 14, 13, 12, 11, and 10. So 10 should be here. So I've created two little jumper leads here. So we'll go from the outer leg here and we'll jump to pin nine, which is the sixth pin in. So let's just make sure we count along. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's pin nine. And then a shorter piece of wire here to go from the other leg. And that will go to pin 10, which is the fifth pin long, like so. So that circuit's now complete. And if this chip was powered up, it would actually now drive and work. In order to power it, we need to connect it back up to our voltage rail. And we have two voltage pins we used previously, which we can reuse again.
So ground is on pin eight, which is right next to the pin we last used. So we'll just tap that across. Again, it's very, very fiddly, but there we go. That's ground. And now five volts is next to it on seven. So we'll go into seven. There we go. Just make sure we've got that correct. Yep, that's looking good. So now the chip is actually powered up. What you should really do is, where possible, look at grounding all the uh, grounds on a chip because it has more than one. So there is another ground on this side at pin 22, which is seven along. So we can literally count this if we want. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we want to ground There we go, and we can ground like so into seven. So now we need to attach our reset line back up. So you remember our button that we pressed that forces a reset? Well, there's no button over here to press. So we've got the pin empty here on the reset switch, and we're going to put a new line in from here. And reset is on pin one, and pin one is actually denoted by another little black mark here. which you can see, and we can now just put this on to pin one. And that's the reset line. Right next to the reset pin on pin two is RX, which is the terminal or serial in, and that's used for us to transmit the data. So we've still got our pin that we're using before, which is our main serial link. So let's just link that in up here and that will link into pin two. Okay, so finally what we need to do is we need to reattach our video. Now the pins for this have completely changed. So first of all, we need to attach our sync, which goes to our 1K resistor. And video sync is on 15, which is the furthest pin in this corner here. And we can link from the 1K resistor to pin one on our chip. And that will be our sync signal. And then we need to actually add our composite video signal, which goes through our 470 uh, resistor or ohm resistor here. And the video is driven from pin 13, which is unfortunately the second one right under this stack here. So I've created this little bit of bent wire so we can plug in just at the base of the resistor and it's the second pin up we'll have to go just above the stack that's been used for the reset line and again this is very fiddly just make sure you're in the right pin which is number two which is there and that's now in so we'll get ready for a final test i've replaced the orange jumper wire with a more solid green uh, cut bus wire it's up to you if you want to do that you don't have to uh, first thing then, let's try our USB socket, like so. And we've got power in off an iPhone adapter using a uh, mini USB. So let's power up and see what happens. And there we go, that's fantastic. Let's just check the keyboard. Yep, that's looking good. You'll notice that with the new kernel for the uh, interpreter added, you notice it now says hello instead of corrupting and the version is 14.2 let's just try tone let's say 200 comma 100 yep you heard that so tone works again it's very screechy on the buzzer but uh yeah that all seems to work really really well so I hope you found that interesting and it gives you some ideas of things you might want to try implementing if you're following along with the build. I have to say the feedback so far and the response to the Tiny Basic Computers project has been absolutely awesome. I'm really excited about the project and I've got big plans to push it through 2021, 2022 and beyond. 
As always, if you're brand new around here, thank you so much for your company. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, a reminder of the Facebook group if you want to join in with the community. It's free to join and there you can get hold of the free ROM downloads. Again, the address is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash WFS Tiny Basic. But until next time, and as always, keep safe. Thank you so much for your company and I will see you real soon right here on the channel. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you